Look, guys, I've had a lot of people on this read along that have started to drop me messages and say things like, you know what? I just uh, this book was too hard for me. I just I just don't think that this series is for me. So I'm going to go ahead and bail. And you know, my first instinct is to tell them that's okay. I understand. I understand. But you know what? A little bit lately, I've kind of been like, don't make me throw these ghost hands. I don't want to be the only person reading Dust of Goddamn Dreams next year. So buck up, baby, and let's finish this. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bridge burners? Mike, back to talk a little Deadhouse Gates and opening aside, guys. If you feel like you had to bail on the series, I understand. I just like to make jokes about ghost hands because I don't get it. Anyway, so what this is, guys, we're going to be talking about books three and four in the epilogue of Deadhouse Gates. That is Chain of Dogs, Deadhouse Gates, and of course, just the epilogue. Uh, if you're looking for parts uh, books one and two, I did the spoiler review for that already. And again, I don't like to use the word review. It's not really a review. I'm just going to kind of talk about things that uh, that kind of stuck with me. I don't think I could do a proper review for Malazan books because they're just insane. Uh, I'll be doing my standard review later, but this is just a spoiler talk. It's not a beat-by-beat -beat plot summary or anything like that. Just going to talk about some things I want to talk about. Now, we had five groups in the last uh, video for Deadhouse Gates. This one, we're going to be down to two. Or I'm sorry, we're going to be down to four because uh, two of them joined up together. Fiddler joined with Acarium's group. So uh, that way we can have just uh, a nice little four segments here. Uh, I'm going to kind of break it up by group just like I did last time. We're going to begin by talking about Kalam, everyone's favorite claw assassin. I will not lie, I enjoyed books one and two much better for Kalam than I did book three three, and most of four. Uh, basically, if it's Kalam on a boat, story okay. If it's Kalam going uh, John Rambo, I'm coming for you, Murdoch. Story amazing, because that last part of Kalam's story this is just so fun and so glorious. It's so fun seeing him just be completely in his element and just be this badass that we all know that he is. And just taking down other Claw Assassins was so, so good. I think for me, the part on the boat... Uh, besides who Salk Elin was, I didn't feel like there was really too much there to keep me interested. Did not guess that. I mean, look, guys, you're going to hear me say this a lot with uh, with Malazan. I didn't guess that because I'm already a along-for-the-ride type of reader, so I don't really guess a lot of these things. A lot of people, oh, you didn't see that coming? No, I don't because I just like to be in the moment and just kind of... I don't have the years between these books to think about like other people did to, to, to theorize and stuff like I would like A Song of Ice and Fire or something, something I've been waiting for forever. So on a binge read, no, I'm not going to see that coming because, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm just kind of along for the ride. But it being Pearl, that actually really surprised me. But, uh, yeah, it pissed me off just a little bit, you know, that he basically he stabs Kalam in the ribs and gets away with it. But uh, something tells me uh, that that's not going to be forgotten anytime soon. But um, back in Malice City, like I said, where you've got Kalam, like, taking out the other claws, is just such good stuff. Nice cat and mouse. Seeing him at, like, the, the peak of his talents, it's always a lot of fun. Even though he basically starts, you know, at level zero, you know, <laughs> he doesn't even have a shirt and just kind of acquiring power-ups as he moves along here. So you can see the kind of the D&D the, the &D or whatever role-playing game. that I said D&D &D last time and people jumped all over me. It's actually this. Look, I've played D&D &D and that's it. I don't know all these other tabletop games. So I'm just saying D&D &D because I know uh, it originated from a D&D &D game. And it might have been other things. But again, just want to get that out there. But yeah, you can see the D&D kind of element here where, you know, hey, we're going to acquire weapons and I'm going to roll and see what he can do next. But uh, the confrontation with the scene uh, in, in Mox Hold is just so good. Uh, I love, I was, I mean, I was like on the edge of my seat here. But, um, Look, Erickson was so brutal with this book. I won't lie. I was at, at this point. I'll talk about what happens there at the end. But uh, at this point in the book, so many bad things had happened to characters that we like. Uh, I was not going to be shocked if you know while he's talking to the scene, if he had Topper come in there and stab him in the back or something. I was like, Erickson is 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 so brutal in this book. He almost makes Joe Abercrombie's first law book seem kind of like Disney at times. That's just how brutal it is. And I know that you guys do not like when I use the word grimdark with Malazan. Mr. Erickson himself doesn't like me using that word, so I don't want to use it. But this book 
is extremely grimdark, guys. I, I don't know what to tell you. So, yeah, that had me kind of in a negative space by I got to that time with Kalam. But it actually has a really good resolution, even though I'm not really sure I even understand what it is. I like their conversation. I like the, the resolution they come to. But I'm not quite sure if Lacine is even alive. I don't even know what the word is. It's like you, you find out that, um, that he was talking to a corpse and it was just her voice. So was she even there? Is that her dead body? And she's like ascended or something? I, I don't know these things, guys. Like I said, I still don't even understand what the ascendants actually are, I don't think. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, lots of questions there. But the confrontation was really good, and, and I liked how it played out. Still not quite sure about the Kalama Manala romance yet. But you know what? I guess everyone needs some love in this dark, dark world. Uh, I, I do love after he leaves, though, and uh, Topper's basically like, oh, I can't call off the the other claws that were going after Kalam, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be worried about it. And basically, he talks about him almost like it's like trimming the fat, and getting off the uh, the dead weight within the claw, <laughs> because Kalam's just going to kill him. It ain't, it ain't anything he's concerned about. Uh, as far as the rest of Kalam, I guess the only other thing that kind of tied into it, and I don't know where else to put it, is Lestara the most pointless character in this book, or what? I just could not find myself caring about this character or anything that happened to her at all. The whole Red Blades thing, I'm hoping it makes sense later, because so far I'm just not really interested at all. Like, she gets, like, apprehended, I'm just like, okay, whatever. Moving on. Never leave your door open to record when the kids are at home. It never really ends well. Okay, let's move on to uh, Fellison's group here. Um, I'm going to say I was wrong about Bowden in the last the last video. I, I predicted that I thought that he was a claw. Well, it turns out he's a talon, and we learned the difference between a claw and a talon. So I was this close. I'm going to give myself half credit on this one. That'll be about the only thing I think I accurately guess, even if it was wrong in this series, because everything else comes as quite a surprise to me. Uh, but uh, apparently Tavor sent Bowden to protect uh, Fellas. And now that... Not really shocking to me. I mean, they're family, so you kind of felt like there was something in there. But uh, I have to say he's not doing a great job of it. I mean, when they're in the mining camps, he's like barely even there, it doesn't look like. Unless he's doing some major shady stuff off the screen that we don't see. And here, Fellison's so mad, she basically tells him to kick rocks. And he's like, okay, bye. And he just leaves. So I'm like, so is that the magic word? Uh, yeah, just leave. And then, then uh, you're relieved of your duty. Uh, it just seemed really, really weird. Even though he very clearly was still protecting her as we see with uh, with Nawal. Now, with Nawal, that was a character I was like, right? I mean, literally, the minute where I said, hey, I think I kind of like this guy. Erickson just kind of grins and says, got you again, you dumb bastard, because, uh, yeah, he goes all crazy, turns into a bunch of rats, and Culp has probably the most brutal death I've ever read, getting eaten to death by a bunch of rats. That is just... I really liked Culp, so that was the first thing. And then you add on top of that how Bowden dies in Fellison's arms. And it's just, it's a touching scene. It's the first moment, I think, in this book where I was like, okay, these are characters I really liked, and it sucks. Uh, but it, it didn't like, uh, it didn't cut me as what was coming, cut me as deep as what's coming. But it still was the first part where I was like, well, that really sucks. I was already starting to get really, really invested in those characters <laughs> for you to take them away so quick. But, um, yeah, both are, are brutal, brutal deaths, but Bowden's is really just a, a real tearjerker there. I got Shaikh Reborn questions, like a lot of them. I mean, the way that he kind of plays it is it could be Absalar or it could be or it could be fellas in that are walking up to Shaikh's corpse there with, with Toblakai and, and is it Leoman? Is that his name Leoman? And uh, I never thought that it wasn't fellas in. Apparently this is like a big it was supposed to be like a big mystery. If you judge by what people were saying on the Discord, it was supposed to be. It was half the people thought it was Absalar, half the people thought it was was Felicin. With me, uh, I, I think it was Toblika who said, you know, uh, beware of her her companion's hands and you know, ghost hands again. Uh, I, I I don't I don't understand the ghost hands at all, or the boar god. I, I don't get it. That's just one of those things you just kind of roll along with this. But I guess my question is, would any woman do? Would any person do? Did any vessel? Does it not really matter? Just the first person that walks up, hey, you get to be Shaikh Reborn, because it just seems really, really random. Or is this one of those, oh, it was predestined, it was always meant to be this way kind of thing. I, I don't know with this universe yet. I don't know how Taviran Steven Erickson is going to get with this, like it was all kind of meant to happen this way. Or there was uh, unseen forces guiding you here. Uh, but then again, I don't even know if she actually is Shaikh Reborn. Uh, is she just like kind of sharing knowledge? Because I thought for, at first I was like, yeah, it's just this is just Felison doing her usual survival method. She's going to say whatever it takes to survive. 
Because say what you want about Bellison, she's a survivor, and she's going to find a way to do it more than just, you know, throwing her hoo-ha at somebody, I think. She, she will get manipulative any way that she has to. So I think that she's kind of just playing this up a little bit. And then she confronts those three mages and that worked with Shaik, and she, like, knows all the stuff about them. I'm like, okay, maybe she's not full of shit. So uh, I, I wasn't really sure. So I'm at the point now where I'm like, I don't know if she actually is Shaik Reborn or if she's just, like... Shaikh has, has agreed to like share knowledge with her. I, I, I'm not really sure. If it was actually explaining this, I missed it. Uh, I've, right now, it feels kind of like a, a, a read and find out thing. I, I'm not really sure. But uh, I am glad that Abork's still uh, going to stay there with her and kind of be her, her conscience, as they put it. Because uh, she, she definitely needs that. Not that she listens to anything that he says. But, um, you know, I, I do kind of like that... It's going to sound so weird. Uh, like a sibling rivalry, if you will, uh, with, with her and Tavor. Is like, she knows now that Tavor actually sent someone to protect her. She don't care. She's still ready to uh, throw down with her. So I look forward to that confrontation when it happens. And I don't think it's happening soon, but it will happen eventually. Let's go ahead and move to the other. This is a Fiddler and Acarium's group here. This was the section of the book where Ikarium and Mappo's story became my favorite part of the whole story. I uh, just like, right at the halfway point, I really got super invested. I already liked it in the first one, but I was so invested in their friendship at this point that I was already dreading what was going to happen, you know, how it was going to end. I felt like it was no way it was not going to end with them stabbing or clubbing each other or something like that. But um, it, it, it's actually so much more than that. You You get answers to both of their pasts, and it's just... I can't say how heartbreaking that this whole story between the both of them becomes because you learn more about Akarium's past and you're like, that's just, that's just awful. And then you learn more about Mappos and you're like, that's just awful. And, and it just how much he's grown to care for this person that he's been with for hundreds of years, right? It's just my two favorite scenes in this book contain Akarium. There's one scene where him and Absalar are talking about, you know, getting memories back. And that's a really, really powerful. I use it. Uh, I, I wrote down that quote to use in one of my uh, intros that I'll be doing for my actual review of this book. And then there's one that uh, him and Mappo have where he, where Ikari has basically said he's going to let himself be taken by this Azath house to, uh, you know, his, his punishment for what he's done in his past. And Mappo doesn't want to do it. And he basically tells him, if you would call yourself my friend, you will let this happen. And I just, I felt so bad for Mappo, you know? <laughs> so yes, Mappo and Akarium, definitely my favorite part of this book. Their story is just so great. Uh, true brotherhood. One of my favorite duos already in this series. And uh, I hope to see more of them going forward. Another one of those I didn't see that coming moment was uh, where Servant is revealed to be Absalar's father. I've seen other people say they guessed it when there was a boat down below uh, Iskral Pus, uh, what down there in the catacombs or whatever. Uh, no, I didn't think it. Hey, there's a boat. That means this. I, I guess I wasn't thinking backwards enough for that one. I never really thought about what happened to Absor's father. I thought he got ate by a hellhound. You know? So I wasn't actually really looking for him. Nice little twist there, though. Uh, was he calling him Relic or something like that? I was like, you're starting to use a lot of these names. Relic Mal, Malik Rel, Malik Rom. I was like, you're starting to use a lot of these names that sound kind of similar, even if I think I just made up one or two. <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to keep calling him Servant because it's, uh, it's easier to remember that way. But the big thing about this part of the story for me was Fiddler. Because I think Fiddler in Guardians of the Moon really just felt kind of like a tertiary character for the Bridge Burners. Never really felt like huge. I mean, you knew his name. You knew that uh, yeah he was an important part of the company, but I feel like you really got to know him, like you get to know him in this book. And now I think he's one of my favorite bridge burners. You know, I, I can't wait to see more of this guy, and I just love that this dude is just true, just just true honorable to a fault. I mean, he really, really is. Like he has his option to go home, but here at the end, and he's like, uh, no, I'm gonna reenlist because uh, this fight isn't over. So uh, yeah, he's the uh, the every man in the army kind of character that you can find yourself rooting for, even if you're sometimes just like, dude, take go home do do it take care of number one for a minute but no he's gonna do his duty it's hard not to like him as for the uh tremolor the azasta still still um i keep thinking it's like basically fast travel I don't really know you find out that it's like also like a prison and it can hold gods and things like that uh you meet uh gothos is that his name you find out that that is ikarium's father and that's a really interesting scene, especially because you figure out, you find out that, uh, yeah, they deceived Mappo, that uh, Ikarium didn't destroy his village. They did. These nameless ones destroyed that village. 
and, and just told Mappo this. So he's been manipulated. So uh, yeah, he's going to be uh, swinging the club around, I think, when he finds that out eventually. But a uh, nice little uh, spin there that Gothos is saying that, you know, that these, he, he doesn't want to be rescued. No, he seeks solitary. All, all Jogs seek solitaries that's a nice little twist there and i hope we see that character again uh when you get into like the moby stuff and and the divers and the and the soul taken and the magical suit of armor or whatever that's talking to moby i i don't think that that was really clear to me i, I i'm wondering if that's something that'll be clear on a reread or i'm just a dummy I mean, you know either one of these is very very possible but yeah, that stuff was, uh, I, I don't know. I, I was kind of, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm just going to kind of go along with it. I think that uh, was Moby actually a soul taken the whole time? It's kind of what I got as far as why that's important. Not sure. Same with Iskarol Pust and the whole spiders at the end. I don't know how important that is or if I'm supposed to understand it. Uh, as far as Iskarol Pust, uh, it's right there with Krupp and me that I'm just kind of, I'm undecided. I don't know how I feel about them. Uh, I feel like uh, they're, they're kind of played like an idiot, but played also to be like the smartest guy in the room, and I don't know which one it is or if it's both or, or what. Uh, so I'm just kind of uh, indifferent on him. Still remains to be seen. Same with him and Krupp, and we'll see as we go forward. Now let's move to the last group here, the good old chain of dogs. I am finally converted to saying Duiker. So instead of Doiker, I know that upset some people last time. I, admit, I switched to saying Duiker. I'm never going to say Duker because I'll just laugh the whole time because I'm 12. Uh, but um, I think the biggest pushback that I got in Spoiler Talk number one was that Duiker was not clicking for me. Um, now, I never said that I disliked his chapters. Yeah, I, that I felt like the refugee stuff can get kind of tedious at times. Look, look guys, I want to be straight with you here. I haven't read a ton of military fantasy. I think The Heroes by Joe Abercrombie is the only real military fantasy I, I've read. So you got to give me some time to settle in here. I'm not really into the sitting around the campfire, waiting in dread for the battle that's to come, uh, inner company politics and things like that. It's never really interested me. So yeah, those sections will be a little slow for me. When you come to the actual you know, campaigns and the engagements and stuff like that, yeah, sure, it's awesome. And Erickson continues to write amazing action. Uh, with me, just military fantasy is still something I'm learning to grow into. So I, I don't think I ever meant to say that I was not enjoying those chapters. I just always felt like Duiker was, you know, the character in there that was just kind of the viewpoint. Uh, it's a character I didn't really, didn't really matter. I didn't feel that way one way or the other. I felt like he was the least interesting character in those chapters. I always, you know, I like Coltane and people like that a lot more. Uh, so it was. That came quite as a surprise to me <laughs> uh, with the way that this whole story ends here. The Chain of Dogs is very much the uh, the Band of Brothers tale on this. And it's a slow burn. And it's one of those things where you kind of, as you get to know the company, you're going to slowly become attached to them. But I think that Erickson's so good at this that you don't know that it's happening. You don't realize how much you care for them until what happens at the end of this book happens and you know what I'm talking about here. I just want to say everyone that told me the ending of this book is an all timer and it's going to crush you emotionally. I was like, yeah, you, you guys are just saying that because you're rereaders and you know everything that's coming and you've grown to love some of these characters over time. No, not true because this part of the book messed me up so bad. I couldn't read anything for two days afterwards and I was waking up in the middle of the night and the first thing I thought about was like, why would you write that? <laughs> Uh, and, and God, yeah, Malik Rell, I want him to just die slowly, right? So these are the things that bother me for a couple of days afterwards. But for me, the, the, the toughest thing about this is you went with this band across this continent and these refugees, and they finally, they're like a thousand feet away from achieving their goal in Arun, and then they can't get in. And you as the reader feel like you're behind those walls with everyone just watching this group that you've been traveling with this long get needlessly slaughtered because Pormqual's a big old pussy. It just completely gutted me. And I'm sure that's what he was going for. And these are the kind of politics and war that happen. It's it's terrible. It really is. But I think it's written so well. And I got to say the death of Coltane was so draining that it was just tough to read. It really, really was. And uh, I feel for Squint. And I understand why Squint is missing now. <laughs> you know, because he's always going to be that guy who, who shot Coltane, you know, even if it was a mercy. Uh, yeah, just incredibly powerful and just heartbreaking. But wait, there's more. 
I, I got to think it gets even better here because Malik Rell, he's definitely the worm tongue of this series, I think, in that he is in, in Porm Qual's ear. And you think all your hate is kind of aimed at Porm Qual for this, but you can kind of see that he's just kind of being manipulated. He might have be one of those things where he kind of got that job title due to who he knew or his family connection, something like that, and he wasn't ready for it. So when you have a big moment like that, you're always going to do what your advisor tells you to do. And Malik Rell is very clearly not on the side of the empire so it was it was blatantly obvious but again that kind of uh, train wreck in slow motion that you couldn't stop you know you saw it coming nothing you can do about it but to see as 10,000 unarmed soldiers are slowly put to the cross and die is the grim darkiest thing I've ever read in a fantasy book, guys. And I've read, what, 10 Joe Abercrombie books now? Um, yeah, this is absolutely just brutal. And again, this series might not be grim dark, but this book is. It really, really is. It feels hopeless. It feels, yeah, sure. People say, well, it can't be grim dark if, if there's people who want to do change in the world. I, what if they fail miserably? You know, I, this is just absolutely the darkest shit that I've ever read. And it will absolutely gut you it, it, once you start to invest yourselves in these characters. It really, really will. And then on top of that, this happens to not just 10,000 uh, you know, unarmed soldiers, but up to and including Duiker, who you're like, well, it's okay. You didn't care about Duiker, right, Mike? Well, apparently I did because it is an absolutely devastating final chapter for Duiker to read and I don't pretend to understand the whole ghost jog thing I don't really know that uh whatever uh, again I feel like that'll be a, a, a read and find out um I, I don't know but yeah this was it was tough to read and uh it was one of those things where I was like hey god damn it I guess I did care about Duiker after all so good job on Steven Erickson here in getting you not only to uh, invested in all these characters, but uh, actually feeling something when they leave, because yeah, this this book was crushing. It really, really was. And um, while I'm gonna admit, I I struggled at times with the first half of this book. I, I never got to the point, literally, guys, where I was thinking about DNFing it. I don't. I think that's people just assuming way too much. But there was a point where I was like, oh no, what have I got myself into? Two years of this, <laughs> and everybody kept telling me. The second half is so much better. second half is so much better. Trust me. Just power through. The second half is so much better. I'm here to tell you guys, struggle through. The second half is incredible. It really is. It is a thing now where I'm like, I'm going to say two books in here, uh, what one-fifth through this series. Uh, I think I love it because I can't stop thinking about it. I finished this book over a week ago, and it's still in my head. I've read three books since then, and this is still in my head. It's still what I think about constantly. So... Erickson has done planted that seed in my brain, and I've got to keep going. And, you know, I will say that many times in the early parts of this book, I was like, I can't wait to get back to Genebacchus and those characters that I want to know more about. But by the end of this, the last 50 pages or so, I was like, damn it, I'm going to miss Seven Cities next book, even though it's a terrible, terrible place. <laughs> but um, do look forward to my uh, my, my spoiler talk I'm going to have with my, my Malazan veteran guest that I'm going to be having. What you guys don't know, maybe, if you haven't been following along here, is each one of these, I'm going to close out each book of this read-along by having a guest that is a full series reader. And they're going to come in here and they're going to talk spoilers with me, kind of help me wrap up each book. And for this one, I'm very excited about this. I'll be having Dr. Philip Chase. Uh, Philip Chase uh, runs a really, really spectacular YouTube channel, in case you don't know, and does a great job of talking about books in a way that I wish I could, breaking down themes breaking down real life uh, comparisons, things like that. Just such a, a way that you feel like you're learning when you talk to him. And I can't wait to see his opinions about Deadhouse Gates because I know this is one of his favorites. And um, he's already talked about it with uh, AP Canavan. And, and, and I, I, I think that our conversation will be a little it'll be different enough that I don't feel like that'll take anything away. But I'm really looking forward to picking his brain. That'll be happening the very last day. The very last day of this read-along for Deadhouse Gates is March the 31st. So look for that to drop early that morning. I'll be doing my standard review on March the 29th. And then, guys, on April 1st, 
we begin the channel read along for Memories of Ice. That goes from April 1st to May 31st. So buckle up, guys, because a lot of people tell me that is their favorite book in this whole series. And I am, as much as I enjoyed my trip in Seven Cities, if you can call it enjoy, uh, I am looking forward to getting back to Genebacus and seeing what my favorite bridge burners and Tistandy are up to. So I hope you guys will join us on the Discord. The conversation for this never stops. It is quite robust. There's still a lot of people that had said they were struggling, and if it weren't for the Discord and those conversations and those people there to help them out, they would have quit, but they were able to keep going because of that support system. So again, guys, I hope you haven't watched this if you haven't finished the book, but if you have and you're still like, I I'm still not sure, trust me, push through. It's going to be worth it, and you will never have a better support system than right now. So I thank you guys for watching, and I hope that you have enjoyed the second half of this book as much as I did, and I cannot wait to see what's next. So drop in the comments, let me know what you thought about this book, and I will talk to you there.